Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me, and I, and I particularly want to thank Deanne. Uh, she, is not a, she has really been the spirit that helped to make this a book. It started out as an exhibit. It's a traveling exhibit. But I'm not sure it would have ever been a book without Deanne's inspiration and her expertise. And we still turn to her often for advice. If you have questions afterwards that have to do with statistics and some of that profiles, she'll be the one we'll have to turn to. Let me begin by introducing you to a few of these children in this book. This is Sasha. Sasha's father was on death row. Uh, she did not know him. She figured he probably didn't even care about her. Then he was released. All I, all I can assume is he must have been exonerated. And she began to build a relationship with him. And then five years after he was released, he died of hepatitis that had been contracted in prison. He had not been diagnosed and had not been treated while he was in prison. Here's what she said. She said, I was three when he got locked up. I have some memories. We were at the circus and we were riding on an elephant. It had to be a dream. We thought about using that for the title of the book, actually. When he was in prison, I had this grudge against him for not being here for me. When I finally got a chance to talk to him and he let me know what really happened, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. I had jumped to so many conclusions. I had a profound, newfound respect for him, and I realized he really did love me. Sometimes now I dream about a situation that's happened to me. I know he hasn't been there, but he'll be there this time. He'll be talking to me like my conscience. He'll talk me through it. He'll be the person that takes the mask off everything and tells me how it really is. This is Travis. Travis shared a letter, a copy of a letter he had written to his father. Dear Dad, I hope you're doing fine. I prayed for you, and I'm going to pray for you tonight. I hope you won't have to have any surgery. I really don't want you to have any surgeries because they hurt. I hope you get your favorite kind of medicine you need to take, a flavor that you like. I went to culture night again, and this time I didn't drum. I want to wait until you come home to drum with you because you're my favorite dad and the best dad I could have. I think you're the greatest drum teacher for me. I know one dance move already. And you can teach me some more dance moves for the drum. I hope you had a good week. I love you, Dad. And then there is Jasmine. I thought for a minute she was reading, she was reciting poetry. She said, I felt so sad, I was just crying. It just made my head hurt, my brain hurt, my stomach hurt. It just got control of me. It got my mind twisted. I couldn't focus on anything. A whole lot of days I couldn't go to sleep without my mom. I had some bad dreams, so my daddy gave me an invisible necklace. It helped me dream about my mom. I had a dream that she had come back. I was walking, I opened my eyes, I saw my mom, and I grabbed her. I couldn't live without her. It was like a curse. It was like a prison. I'm just glad she's back now. Well, those are a few of the three million children in this country who on any given day who have a parent locked up. The, the total figure, of course, masks some tremendous racial and ethnic disparities. The figures I had when I came here were that there were 1 in 15 uh, African-American children had a parent in prison, and 1 in 41 Hispanic children, and 1 in 110 white children. And Deanne tells me there's a new study just been released that makes it look much worse than that. Well, we interviewed children here in Arkansas and other parts of the country. Most of them were urban, but a few were rural. We discovered that these children face all the challenges that any child faces when, they have, when they're missing one or both parents, but that there's a whole other layer on top of that of challenges. One of those challenges is the shame you feel at having a parent in prison, a kind of guilt by association, and then the sense of isolation. So many of the children said they were afraid to talk about it. They didn't want other people to know. Um, Latrell, Latrell's father, he's never met. He's only spoke to once on the phone, is in prison. His stepfather has been in and out of prison, and his mother had recently died in prison, who was also in prison, of a drug overdose. He lives now with his grandmother. His interview is short. He said, I don't really talk about it. In fact, his sister who came with him said it was the first time she'd ever heard him say anything about it to anybody outside the family. 
So this sense of guilt and, and I mean, of shame, but also the sense of guilt. Many of these children felt that somehow they must have been responsible for their parent being in prison. They'd struggle. You know how kids tend to take things on themselves. So there was not only shame, there was a sense of guilt that often went with it. There was a lot of anxiety, not just for their loved one, but they often felt very anxious about the situation their parent was in. They were anxious about their caregivers. Many of these are being taken care of by grandparents and they were older and they worried about their grandparents' health and about their economic situation. Um, a lot of anger, ambivalent anger, anger that got directed at their parents, that got system, and yet they felt like their parents loved them, they, they knew they loved them. In Britain they said, I hated my mom when she first went in. I thought she didn't love us, but I also missed her. I'd feel really mad and then I'd have to just start crying because I knew she wanted to be with us, that she did love us. People would tell me that she wasn't in there because she didn't love us. She was in there because she made a mistake and she didn't want to get out and be with us. I had one friend I would talk to about it. Sometimes everyone tries to make it sound like it was a nice experience. It was just bad. If this does happen to someone, I tell them to talk to people instead of keeping it in because that just makes it worse. And they love you, and they didn't do it to hurt you. They just made some mistakes. Another thing we frequently heard is a confusion about the truth. It seems that many caregivers, in the interest of trying to protect their child, don't tell them the truth of what happened. And what happened in many cases is at some point along the line, the child began to suspect that this wasn't the truth, or someone like a nasty cousin would start teasing them that their parent was in prison or something, and then they began to develop trust issues. Jermaine said, my father was locked up 15 years. I asked my mom and stepdad about it. The answers I got said it was something serious, but they weren't going to tell me about it. I waited for them to say something, but they never did. To this day, I fear that it could happen to me. If what happened to him happens to me, will I react the same way and put myself in the same prison, same position? He said, having my father in prison changed my life by causing me to be my, by myself more. It made me get involved as well. I try to do things for other people rather than myself. It's almost like ADD. I have to do something. I have to do, try to achieve more. Why am I doing this all? You feel like there's a deeper problem or issue that you've got to solve, but you can't figure out what it is. It's hard to get at the roots of it. Maybe one day I'll find out the meaning of all this, why he got locked, locked up and stuff like that. One day it's going to unravel, and I'll find out why, and hopefully make my life better. Many of the children talked about having to grow up fast. Brittany said, life would have been different if my parents hadn't been in prison. I would have been graduating high school this year, going to senior prom, doing all the other stuff kids do instead of growing up too fast. I had to grow up real quick. I've lived on the streets. I've lived with friends, family, boyfriends. I've done it all. I'm fixing to be 18, and I never thought I'd see 16. Because I wasn't in school, I had no education. I was living on my own on the streets, and I thought that someday someone would kill me. I thought I'd be dead. But I'm still standing. I'm cheerful. What I've been through has made me who I am today. I'm not a weak-minded person. I'm very strong. If you have a mom or dad locked up, it's not your fault. It's nobody's fault but theirs. They made their choices. They decided to go down that road, not you. Don't feel guilty for their mistakes. These are some of the issues that we heard from these young people. They obviously have serious implications for these young people, but they have serious implications for us as a society as, whole, as a whole. Various studies have shown that the, British, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, for instance, says that children who have parent prison are twice as likely to face serious mental health issues, trauma, attachment disorders, developmental regression, anxiety, that they're three times more likely to have behavioral problems such as aggression, acting out, antisocial behavior, and that they're more likely to face educational issues, such as attention disorders, learning disabilities, poor performance, and so forth. My friend, my friend Michi, Marie Scott, who I've known for many years, is a lifer. She's serving an actual life sentence in Pennsylvania. Her parents were in prison, 
and her son who was in prison for a while. He got out, he turned his life around, was doing well, when a couple years ago he was killed in a motorcycle accident. This is her daughter, Hope, and Michi, as she's known, has a real, her passion in life is families, children of parents who have parents in prison. She talks about intergenerational incarceration because she said, I've been in these years and I suddenly realized the young women I was looking out for were the children of the, and I knew their mothers, that these were the, these were the daughters of the mothers that I also know in, in here. We often talk about intergenerational trauma, and I'm going to talk in a little bit more about that, but our program works after September 11. We were tasked to develop a program called STAR that trains people from around the world in how trauma works, not just in our individual lives, but in, in communities and societies, and then developing strategies to deal with that. And one of the things that we emphasize is the way trauma is transmitted. I like to say it this way, if trauma that's, that's uh, unaddressed is reenacted, if we experience trauma and we don't deal with it, it is going to be reenacted in our lives, in our families' lives, in future generations. Starr says it a little differently. I think they say uh, uh, trauma that's not transformed is transferred. That's another way of putting it. But the, the, the reality is that these traumas have a way of working their th way through families and through society. Annabelle said, my father started getting arrested when I was around five. My brother was in prison, is in prison. I've always been pressured to keep things together because everything was so chaotic. I just wanted to be free of problems. I thought if I moved as far away as possible, I wouldn't have to deal with anything. So they, her family's in California, she moved to Pennsylvania. But being far away didn't stop the fact that I still have to deal with everything, even though I wasn't physically there anymore. It was something you weren't supposed to talk about outside the house. Once I got older, I found friends I trusted, I actually talked about it. But sometimes you wonder how good it really is to talk about it. My friends can sympathize, but they don't really know what it's like. I'm trying to find some way to express everything I'm feeling through my artwork, but I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with explaining it, especially with a bunch of strangers to my college class. When I watch my baby, it's inspiring. My son is the best thing that could have happened to me. Family is central. Even though it often didn't work, sometimes it does. You know, many, every year we release three, uh, three quarters of a million prisoners in this country, and many of them end up going back to prison. The studies have suggested that one of the most significant factors in whether people go back to prison is contact with their families. And yet 50% of parents in prison say they have never had any contact with their families, with their children. There are a variety of reasons for this. It has, sometimes it's kind of inhospitable treat, uh, policies on the part of prisons. It's because we place our prisons all the way, all over the place. In Pennsylvania, where I lived and worked for quite a while, uh, you know that a lot of the prisoners come from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and they're placed in obscure mountain areas and very hard to get to by families. Many of these children end up in foster care or, or living with grandparents. 50% of the mothers in prison have a chi child living with their grandmother. Um, and it has huge impacts for these caregivers. As you can imagine, many times these grandparents are at a stage in life when they don't have the energy to keep up with young people. They don't have the finances that they once had. They may have had dreams of what they were going to do in retirement and now raising children. And many of them, grandparents we talked about, talked about how they lost their circles of friends because they, they had children to raise, their friends didn't. Martha Airy lives in rural Virginia. She said, I used to go, and she's raising her great-grandchildren. I used to go out with my friends and eat, but I don't have those friends anymore. One of my best friends has a little granddaughter. She moved, and I miss her so much. I've asked for the same thing for Christmas and my birthday from my family, for two hours on top of Spruce, Spruce Knob, that's a local mountain near where I live, by myself. I didn't get it. That's all I asked for. If they would just take the boys so I can go out on the mountain for two hours by myself, that's all I asked for. But I didn't get it. To other caregivers, I'd say, you need to really think about how far you can go and not crack. These are some of the challenges we heard for both children and caregivers. 
Two interesting things, though. One of them is how resilient and hopeful these children are. In spite of all of these challenges, the thing that I kept coming away with, and that I think you'll come away with if you look at this book, is their remarkable resilience and, and hopefulness. The other... <coughs> Didn't eat chocolate chip cookies right before you go on to speak. Ah. The other thing we heard is that people like teachers could either be the source of incredible trauma or the, so, so, the source of salvation. We heard horror stories of insensitive things that teachers did that were very hurtful, but we also heard stories of teachers who made all the difference in the world, that an interest and a concern by a sensitivity by a teacher was the turning point for many children. So part of the reason we wrote this book is for teachers. So we had a number of goals when we did this book. One of them is we wanted to provide some help for these children themselves so that they might not feel so alone. And I've been excited to hear from grandparents and one of my former students this morning who's working with young women whose parents are in prison. And she says, she says her Young women are excited about this book. They're carrying it around with them. They're reading it to each other. They're talking about it. Now they want to write to some of the other young people in the book. So we hoped it for that. We also aimed it for caregivers. There are sections in the book for grandparents who might be raising these children, help them understand why these kids are acting the way they are, and maybe some suggestions, and people like teachers and social workers. And, of course, we wanted to raise consciousness in general about the impact of our policies. You know, we have 5% of the world's population in this country, and we have 25% of the world's prisoners in this country. And we just wanted people to be aware of some of the consequences of that, of what we might call, what Nell Bernstein calls the collateral damage of our prison pop, uh, policy. Well, briefly, I came to this work through my background in restorative justice. I worked for... 30-some years in this field we call restorative justice. And you may have heard of it. It's, it's a very popular term now. Unfortunately, everybody's calling everything restorative justice, so it's a little hard to tell what's really restorative justice. And the media's main interest, and we get constant calls from the Oprah Network and others, is interested in high-profile, serious crime dialogue when you bring victims and offenders together uh, with a facilitator. And that's part of restorative justice. But restorative justice is basically a different way of looking at wrongdoing, whether we're talking about school wrongs or whether we're talking about crime. You know, our justice approach normally is to say that what you did is you broke some kind of rule, and therefore you ought to make sure, we're going to make sure you get what you deserve. We're saying that justice really ought to be harm and needs-based, that when you do something wrong, what really matters is the harm that you caused. And when harm is caused, needs are generated. And so we ought to be sorting out the harms and needs and the obligations for that. So it revolves around this concept of harms, needs, and obligations. Well, if you look at the harm of crime, these children are a big part of the harm of crime. And that has led me to get engaged with this and to try to help the rest of us understand that. One of the ways this connects for me is that the more, as I've worked with restorative justice, and I've done a lot of work with victims, I started out as an offender advocate, uh, but today I'm on the victim advisory group of the U.S. Sentencing Commission because of my interest in, in victim issues, um, is that what we call the cycle of trauma. In our STAR program, I, mean, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but what we began to realize is that when you are traumatized, you go through this cycle, and if you don't break out of that cycle, you can become a per perpetrator. That many, 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 maybe most perpetrators have either been victims or believe they've been victims. Psychologist James Gilligan, in a really important book called Violence, a Reflection on a National Epidemic, says that all violence is an effort to do justice or undo injustice. All violence is an effort to do justice or undo injustice. In other words, when we do violence, we see ourselves as victims and we're trying to undo that injustice. And of course, that's one of the reasons the punishment system works so badly. You punish somebody that's a victim, it just makes them into a victim again. Uh, but what we're seeing is a cycle. Of, that if we don't treat trauma, it, we can, people can become perpetrators. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons it's so important to address the needs of these children. The other thing that really draws me from restorative justice is, you know, one of the reasons we got into restorative justice in the first place is that we felt 
that the way people commit offenses by not, is by not empathizing, not empathizing with the person they've harmed. I've had burglars say, I went in the house, I turned the pictures against the wall so I wouldn't have to think about who I'm harming. Then we put them in a system that says, make the state prove it. So your attorney says, plead not guilty. That doesn't exactly help empathy. And then we put them in prison where there's no culture of, of understanding each other. What we're really interested in restorative justice is reducing social distance. In other words, that, that we can do terrible things to people when we distance them. That's how we can carry out wars. That's how we can imprison so many people. I am really interested in process, projects that reduce social distance. So this has been one of those efforts is to, and a lot of my photography is aimed at reducing social distance. I did two, uh -oh, what did I do here? I pushed it. There we go. I did an earlier book called Doing Life where I did interviews and photographs of men and women serving actual life sentences. My goal was that instead of always talking about so-called offenders as stereotypes, that we talk, we'd interact with a real person. So I interviewed them and, and did portraits. Then I did a book called Transcending, which is a similar format. Interviews and portraits of men and women who had experienced very severe crime, people who had family members murdered, rape victims, and so forth. My goal was to reduce our social distance, to help us interact with people as real people. So the goal for this book was to help us to encounter these young people, to, to hear their stories, to give them a chance to have a voice, to tell, to, so these are their words, not our words. Let me, be, let me conclude with two uh, quotes from two stories. This is Taylor. Taylor said, I remember when they came and got her. I was sad. I really was. I was crying because it was hard to see them come and take my mom. I was mad at everybody. You could say I was mad at the world. I didn't want to talk to nobody to tell people how I felt. I didn't want to be around nobody. I took my anger out on other people. At times, it's like I'm mad at her for not being here, for being locked up. You know, she shouldn't have done what she did. But then again, at times, I feel sad because she's there and she's not here with me. I just can't have her around like I want. I felt like nobody could understand what I was going through because they probably didn't have it happen to them. Didn't nobody understand me? You know, I was just misunderstood. I want other ch kids to know that even though your parents are locked up, they're not bad people. They just did something they shouldn't have done. And it really affects us, the kids. It really does. And I want them to know that we'll get through it. As long as we have someone there that's to help us, we can get through it. It makes you stronger. I know it's made me stronger, but you have to grow up fast. And finally, one more. This is Stacy. Stacy now has a PhD. But it's been a hard struggle getting there. Her father was incarcerated in another state, so she hardly knew him, and yet he was an incredibly important person to her. To, uh, she went through and she describes the various kinds of the poor relationships she had men, with men, the struggles she had with alcoholism, all these things that she went through. And it was a, it was a teacher, a professor, that turned her life around. She said, I remember my dad wrote me two letters the whole time he was incarcerated. I read those letters over and over. He drew a little Snoopy on one. They thought he was thinking about me while I was in prison. That, that thought, I can't even say how much that meant to me. It was that connection I was looking for. I was prevented from that by my family and by the circumstances. He was incarcerated far away in North Carolina. There is a sense of loss with these experiences. It should be dealt with in some way. You don't have to beat it to death, but it should be addressed in some therapeutic way. And I think it would have been nice to connect with others who were dealing with the same issues or even close to that. Even just an absent dad, that would have been nice. I didn't have formal, men formal mentors, but the people who came into my life acted as mentors. They were there for the long haul and they weren't expecting me to be perfect. I've talked to some adults who as children of incarcerated parents had mentors who when things got tough for the kids started acting out, the mentors left. I think that's the worst thing that can happen. But if mentors continue for at least a year, I think they can make a huge difference. I think the incarceration of a parent should be a signal to communi communities and systems that there are things going on with families. Well, I'm always looking at a way to combine my photography and my justice work. And one of the connections to me is a core value, and that's the core value of respect. I have tried in my photography to do photography in a way that is respectful to my subjects, and I really think that's what restorative justice is about. It's really an effort to provide respect. When I talk to 
people who have offended. I often find that their offending behavior was an effort to get respect in some way. And then we put them in a legal system that gives them no respect. And then we're surprised that they don't come out respectful. And when I talk with victims, I find that part of their trauma is the disrespect they felt by the offender, but the disrespect they often felt by the system and their loved ones. Because their loved ones don't want to deal with this, and they say things like, well, you need to move on. You shouldn't be so angry. You need to forgive. And so they feel disrespected all the way around. I think what we're looking for is an experience of respect. I have a good friend who's a playwright. She did a book based on my victim book called Transcending. It was an exciting project. We went to prison with it as well as communities. Uh, she used to come and train my students as she trained her actors. And she would do exercises, and she said her conclusion was, it's a sacred trust to represent someone. And I take that very seriously, and I hope I have done justice to the people in this book. My goal is to approach justice and to approach photography that's not on the cutting edge, but I like to say is on the healing edge. Thank you. Thank you for that. If uh, We do have some time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Annie? Thank you so much. I have two observations, and your last comment was so related to it. In talking to incarcerated people, and particularly those who felt like they had never had true justice, and you would ask them what is the, the lack thereof, and most of them said they had a public defender, the most inexperienced lawyer you could have, and they felt like they'd never had a fair chance at justice, and so therefore they became a victim of justice. The second is, when you talk about healing, is that what happens to them when they leave. When I paid for my car, I got my title back, regardless of how much it cost, $200 or 3000 When I paid for my house, I got my deed. When a prisoner pays the debt, they lost their citizenship when they went in. They didn't get it when they came out. That, they feel, is that they were cheated. What is your response to those three things? Should they ever get restored what they had? Have they had justice at the judicial system? And what should they be given for the time that they're there that we hear this thing that it costs so much for one? All of the federal prisons in everywhere I've ever visited, they do their own laundry, they do their own cooking, they do their own cleaning, they do their own preparing of the horses, all of the work, they do that. So what is the credit that they get for when they're working in prison? Well, I'm, I'm with you on that, and that's one of the things we're trying to do with restorative justice is to get people to rethink what accountability really means. I often say to the judge, you know, we want to hold offenders accountable, but what does spending time in prison have to do with accountability? You end up in there costing the state, uh, you end up there, you pay your debt in some abstract way, but then you come out and you're still an ex-offender, there's no, no ceremony to reintegrate you into the community. Uh, what we want is accountability that's genuine, that's meaningful. In other words, if we think that you ought to face up to what you've done to understand the consequences of what you've done and try to make it right to the extent that you can do that. I don't have time to go into all this, but there's a whole lot of interesting work being done on shame theory. And one of the things that it says is that you, if you're going to make people, help people deal with the shame, you have to have rituals of reintegration. You have to have ways to remove that shame and turn it into pride. And we are just lacking that in, in our society. There's just, I, I ran to one judge, it was really interesting, in Ohio a number of years ago. When he sentenced someone to prison, when they came out of prison, he called them into, the, into, his, into his courtroom and congratulated them and welcomed them back into the community. I couldn't believe it. I mean, that's the first time I'd ever heard of that. He'd call them in there and he would congratulate them for doing that and welcome them back. Uh, we don't do that very often, so it's huge. There's the, I'm going to have to go with the mic here, and then there he hopefully saw it. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon. Um, here in Arkansas in the legislature, uh, just this week, uh, a bill was passed that would allow effectively for the, um, for the Department of Corrections to kind of farm out 
uh, incarceration to other states where it's cheaper uh, to house inmates. I was wondering if you could speak to, um, especially in your interaction with uh, the children, how, how you think that that might impact our state if that's the route that we do take. Well, a lot of states are doing that. Uh, and it's hugely problematic, as you can imagine, because it makes visiting that much harder. Uh, visiting gets almost impossible. Uh, so I think it's very problematic. And I don't know, Deanne, you may have something else to add on it, but I'm sorry to see you go that way uh, as a state. is to reduce the cost of incarceration. And I think the price we pay uh, to send our prisoners to Louisiana is, is pretty severe in terms of the recidivism rate, Howard talked about, the impact on family ties. And um, I, I think we should be, as, a, as a, a state and a community, accountable to our prisoners for how we treat them. And I'm not particularly fond of the Louisiana prison system. So uh, I think there are a lot of reasons to, to be concerned about this, this new policy. There's a hand here. Coming behind you, hold on. Uh, I'm, this is a question as much as a statement. I thought we did have halfway houses for people coming out of prison. And I know that quite often they try to set halfway houses up and uh, the neighbors don't want it. So, I mean, you can't stick them out in the middle of a cornfield somewhere where there's no one around. How do you address that? Well, I, I can't speak to Arkansas. We have very few halfway houses in Virginia. And so what it means is someone comes out of prison, they're just dropped back into society with a little bit of money and they're supposed to find their own way. Um, and even when you do halfway houses, it doesn't necessarily solve the need for rituals of reintegration. It helps with the transition, but there still aren't those things that welcome people back. Now, we have one in our neighborhood, a halfway house. It's been there that, right next to the university. And it's really unusual because they did a lot of work when they started with the neighborhood. And a few years ago, a local legislator tried to close it down. And what you know, the neighbors all called him in and wrote, read him the riot act. Uh, and so I think it, a lot of it is how one builds these things. Yes, if you just plunk it down in the community, they're very communities are often very upset about it. If you work with a community to understand what their needs are and so forth, I think it's possible to, to place halfway houses. But our experience has been as money gets tight, those are what gets cut. I mean, our halfway house has been cut way back. The Department of Corrections is not, has just cut its funding way back. Uh, it's very misplaced priorities, I think. But that's what happened, what's happened for us. Yeah. Yeah, we need to do it. We need more treatment. I mean, a, a lot of the prisons have very little treatment facilities. You know, if you've got a drug problem, going to prison, you can get drugs. Everybody inside tells me I can get drugs easier in here than I can get them on the street. Uh, if we, we need to be putting the money into things like treatment and so forth, not just locking people up, I think. Anyone else? Right here, Caroline. Well, as a grandmother, I would like to thank you for your great interest and your desires to do this. Um, it's, it's really perplexing that I know there are a lot of intelligent people out there that work in the prison systems and in this whole area, but why they can't come to the common sense decisions that you just explained to us is beyond me. Uh, why there's so much hatred and so much bitterness and so much anger out there in our world that we feel like we have to desperately punish them and, not, and then just, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. Our system does just not make sense. Well, you know, one of the problems is we, we have a lot of very large institutions and management is a real issue and Families aren't always very cooperative. I mean, families do sometimes smuggle drugs in and so forth, and it's very easy for prisons to get so centered on the security ashes of it that they lose sight of the other. Uh, I do a lot of work with a big prison near Philadelphia. It's got, I don't know what the population is now, but it was like 4,200 men when I was in there. It's huge. 
Uh, and so the management issues are huge. And in spite of that, that prison has some really community-friendly policies. So it is possible. I, I'm just saying that there are, I don't think it's nasty people, but I think it's the implications of some of our policies and the pressures we put people under and priorities with funding and that kind of thing. Crime has gotten so politicized in this country. That's one of the huge problems. It's almost impossible to have a reasoned discussion about crime policy. You know, the politicians use it. The media uses it. Uh, there are some European countries that have a much lower incarceration rate. And when you talk about it to them, you find that it's not, it's not, they've managed to keep it from becoming a political issue. Politicians aren't trying to get elected by saying, I'm tougher on crime than you are. And that makes a huge difference. Uh, uh, somehow we've got to get de-escalate this rhetoric around this stuff so we can look at what the real issues are. Excuse me. Yeah. Over, over here, Mr. Chair. Right. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. If, is there one suggestion that you could give all of us here who would be interested in fostering ideas of restorative justice in Arkansas? One thing that every, everyone here could do to start that ball rolling? I'm going to let Deanne do a commercial here. She's starting a network. Uh, uh, we, state have, we have started an initiative, a coalition for restorative justice in Arkansas. And we're going to be meeting um, over community bakery um, upstairs on every third Thursday at noon. And we now have a wonderful asset here uh, who is part of restorative justice over in Memphis, and it has engaged the school system. I've just met her today. She's a friend of ours. So I think we've got resources, and DYS called me yesterday, and they are very interested in restorative justice uh, for our youth, and I have seen it alive and well in Pennsylvania where the youth end their accountability by having given back to the community, and they are celebrated and they discover they have value and meaning because they can give back. And I think that's an extraordinary thing to get that phone call just yesterday. So please join us on third Thursday at noon um, over Community Bakery. Good smelling stuff too. <laughs> I, I should say that one of the biggest growth areas internationally right now in restorative justice is schools. So, so many schools are finding that zero tolerance and the punitive policies they have aren't working, and they're implementing restorative disciplinary procedures. Universities, too, there's a training going on at my university right now for universities that want to do restorative processes instead of the usual judicial affairs. So that's one of the biggest places to get into, involved, I think. There was a hand there, and there's one over here, I noticed. Can I speak to that for just a minute? Do you have time for Jean to say a comment just, on it? Just to answer that question, when I started in New Orleans in 2001, I taken Howard's course a couple of years earlier, and um, no one knew restorative justice. They didn't have a wonderful person like this advocating for it. And I, first thing I started doing was educating myself. You can pick up Howard's book on the little book of restorative justice. It's a quick read. There's a whole bunch of little books. Educate yourself, educate yourself, educate yourself, and then just start talking to people. Talk to your neighbor, talk to your child's teacher, talk to your pastor. Just start talking to people. I, we keep about a hundred of those books around. We pass them out like tracks to everybody. Just let other people begin reading. So, I mean, that's something you can do right now. I have a question. Um, how, how do you suggest going about advocating for policy change or effective program change um, for good programs uh, that are happening in certain prisons in states that could be duplicated in other prisons. Um, in Arkansas, there's a great program that's called Unity that we're working on a documentary to, to, to try to spread the word. Um, our foundation supports a great program at Rockers Island that, that trains the inmates that when they leave the prison, then they have a job skill. Um, and it partners with um, a nonprofit, and, and they can go get a job. And so there are some good things happening, and there's got to be other prisons that are doing this too. And 
legislators need to know this, and other places need to know this. How do you suggest that? And well, that is a problem. I mean, on children of prisoner policies, Deanne's a national expert, so I, we all turn to her. She knows where to go for it. But you're right. There's lots and lots of good stuff happening, and there's very hard to know. I mean, like there's some Alabama prisons that are doing meditation, and having this incredible. There's a film out about it, uh, doing teaching prisoners to meditate and having tremendous results. There are a lot of good stuff, but I, it's really hard to know. Do you, Dan? There's no single source that I can think of. Where there is for restorative justice things, there's restorativejustice.org, which tries to keep be kind of a networking website for it. I don't know the answer to that. There, it's, it's hit and miss. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. That we can really demonstrate the effectiveness, because I've seen, I, I was a Soros fellow, and I worked in 14 states to improve policies and practices for these children. And it is very, very difficult uh, to move policymakers unless you've got that evidence base. And we have wonderful researchers. And I just want to proclaim to you that Susan Phillips at Jane Addams uh, College of Social Work, she is a homegirl. And she started a lot of this movement here in Arkansas. She's my mentor, but she's younger than I am. And the research is accumulating daily. I just came from a research symposium in Seattle. You would be astonished. Um, but I think that's the only way we're going to penetrate legislators and policymakers. And replication of programs, you've got to have that evaluative piece to make it you know, really hold water with any policymaker. Because the last thing you want to do if you're an elected official is do something that even suggests that you're soft on crime. Yeah, it's, it's too important to them politically. That's why this bill that Jennifer's talking about, you know, has some rather egregious things in it um, that have to do with they don't want to look soft on, on the issue. And yet we're willing to spend, you know, what, another billion or so dollars on the same system we've got. Um, so it's a pretty serious issue to get that kind of funding. It's the research funding and then the practice funding. The National Reentry Resource. What's it called? National Reentry. National yeah, National Re. That has a website. Has that's a really good place to go for reentry kinds of things and family related. National Resource. National Reentry Resource Center. We're gonna. <laughs> Dan, we're gonna. We've got to help clear the deck on some of the family issues that can really be a minefield when they come out. So uh, the employment issue, huge. Uh, the family issues also need to be there. We started a program in Grand Rapids, and it's working beautifully uh, around the families. It involves community liaisons with parole, and uh, there's some good things happening out there. We're going to go right there and then in the back. Uh, for Deanne, is there state assistance available for family members who have to take care of children of incarcerated parents? Is there any assistance? And two, are there any efforts on the way to restore voting rights to purpose people who have served their times? I have students in my university courses who have gone to prison, served their time, yet they still feel very frustrated that they're not full citizens again. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about, uh, yeah, I, I suppose you're talking about local. I, yeah, I think you'd have to go to the end for that. I mean, the first question, are there services out there that are publicly supportive? Family members. There is nothing other than, you know, our, our welfare to work program, which is TANF, uh, um, which allows a, a grandparent care, caregiver for a child could get $81 a month for the first child. 42 for the subsequent. This is what people complain about as welfare. Um, and then if you have five or more children, it caps at about 4.57. Uh, one of my grandparents figured it out. It's $1.64 a day. Doesn't cover a school lunch. Um, so we are trying to create um, some cross-systems uh, 
recognition of these families and children. And we, we found in a study in Travis County, Texas, that these are million dollar families because these children are showing up in all of our systems and we're not really doing anything because we don't have the knowledge or the information. And uh, on the other hand, at the Soros Institute, they're looking at million dollar blocks, which are the blocks where, the, where most prisoners come from in the whole state of New York. So we've, we've thought about overlaying the million dollar families with the million dollar blocks, so we might have two million dollar families. Um, but there, there really isn't any in Arkansas uh, as yet any really uh, good public assistance. Well, the, some of the grandparents here told us that if, if these children were in foster care, they'd be getting you know, ch support and that the system wants me to let these kids go into foster care and then try to get them back and they don't want to take a chance on it because they're afraid they won't get them back. So. Well, we, we had experts at the um, interim study at the legislature that went on for six months that ended last fall and the experts came in and looked at our dollars spent in foster care and said that the number of relative caregivers taking care of these children while their parents are inside is their, their doing so is valued at about $38 million. That's what foster care is being saved. And these grandparents have no legal rights to their children. They could suddenly show up at the Capitol and say, hey guys, take care of them. $38 million? You see that sitting around in the state budget anywhere to, to help take care of it? Your second question was? Voting rights. Voting rights, restoring voting oh, rights. I think you should talk to the person right across the table from you, Jennifer Hicks, a former Clinton school student. <laughs> we'll, uh, we have a question. Jennifer, we'll do that. Yeah, Jennifer, we'll talk about it after. We're going to end on this last one back there. Um, I work in youth services, and I have a question. Uh, what is your suggestions on a younger youth that has a parent that is incarcerated, and when they go to visitation, I'm talking about like five years of age, and now uh, she views law enforcement totally different. Uh, she's afraid. Is it more damaging or beneficial for her to go to visitation to visit a parent? Uh, and also, are there any services out there that could help that child with counseling to prepare her for things like this? Well, I think the research, and Deanne can check me on this, but I think the research is fairly clear that it's better for these children to have the contact. I mean, how much you tell them is developmental. It's like talking about sex. You know, you got to tell them as much as they're able to do. But I think the, reason, uh, the best evidence, the best practices say they should have as much contact as possible and they should know as much as they're capable of knowing about what really happened. Uh, now, your second question about the services, again, I can't answer that here for Arkansas. Your, your question was what services there might, like counseling and so forth, there might be for these young children. And is there anything uh, specifically that they might be eligible for here? Counseling. Uh, Centers for Youth and Families offers counseling. Um, and I'm very trusting of them because they've had a lot of experience with children incarcerated parents. A lot of therapists and, and counselors do not have a background, and so they may be testifying, say, in court and saying this child should not visit their parent because of their own, you know, intuitive notion that it's a bad thing, whereas we've got the data to tell us it, it's not a bad thing. Uh, certainly there are some parents that they don't need their child visiting, but I think it should be up to the child completely. Well, and the other thing is that we found that as much as they're able, the children ought to know what it's like inside because they often have fantasies about the terrible conditions, they are terrible conditions, but just what their parents are going through. And so if they can somehow get an idea of what their cell or the dormitory looks like and things like that, it's helpful. There are a few children's books that, you know, stories for a child about what it's like to be in prison and so forth that, that can be useful, I think. 